I've been asked to talk in English, so uh, I will. And, uh, you know, I'm a cynical reporter, um, actually quite allergic to rosy pictures of uh, the future. Um, here you all are, cuddled up in uh, pink blankets, uh, saying that the world is getting better. Uh, but yes, it is in some ways. Now, what would you say is the greatest achievement of the Arab revolutions? Some will say toppling a dictator, others will say uh, the uh, wall of fear has been broken down. I would say the image of the Arab has forever changed. You remember the uh, Iraq war. During the Iraq war, I was a reporter in Washington, D.C., and I was uh, watching live coverage of the Iraqi war on American live TV. And uh, I remember seeing reporters embedded, riding in through the desert of Iraq in uh, tanks uh, on the way to Baghdad. And then now and then, uh, a reporter would sort of get out of the tank and talk to live TV and say, well, here we are on the, on the roads to Baghdad, on the roads to free uh, the Iraqi people, and we just passed here a, 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 an encampment, a tent with Bedouins, uh, and we saw them staring at us dumbfounded uh, when they saw this huge machinery moving past them uh, to free them. Now, these uh, one-dimensional postcards of the Arab as the apathetic, passive, uh, perhaps terrorist, definitely undemocratic Arab, uh, they have completely changed. Another uh, thing I remember hearing uh, during the Iraq war was uh, one of these journalists again who uh, got out of a tank and reported back home and talked about the difficulties of knowing if the Arab down the road is a terrorist or not. And the, and the anchor back in Washington or New York said, yeah, that must be really difficult, you know, to know if the woman in a white dress is carrying an explosive belt underneath, if these are uh, enemies or if they are tame villagers. And she didn't make a mistake because she said tame villagers twice. This will never happen again. I hope. And that's why I think the world in that sense um, is uh, getting better. Now we see, we, we talk to Arabs, journalists talk to Arabs on Tahrir Square and they, are, they have become three-dimensional characters. Uh, we see Egyptians with signs, we saw them during the revolution that said, uh, I used to be afraid and then I became an Egyptian. There is a lot of pessimism uh, concerning the Arab Spring and where it has gone, um, especially in Egypt, uh, among the liberals, among the secularists, uh, when it comes to the Islamist takeover. But one m candidate I met uh, during the election campaign, uh, I talked to him. He was uh, one of these old activists, uh, secular, liberal, uh, with all the right values. And uh, I asked him, aren't you afraid of uh, all these Salafis getting into parliament, all these Islamists? And he said something to me that I have remembered since. Listen, the Egyptian people were caught up in a dark room, locked up in a dark room for 30 years. Suddenly someone opens the door. The light is bright outside. They walk out. They're almost blinded by the light. They stumble, they fall. They will continue to stumble and fall. And there will be lots of falling and stumbling in the future. But was it wrong to open that door? Of course not. I happen to think that stumbling and uh, failing um, is uh, an asset. Uh, I'm a great advocate of uh, failures and I have uh, myself as a journalist failed a number of times. Um, the first time I really did 
something wrong was when I was newly appointed as Middle East correspondent in 1993. I was quite young and some of the editors didn't believe in me because I came to the Middle East with a small eight-month-old child and they thought this is not a good idea. So I had everything against me and I went to Gaza to report on Arafat's first press conference after he had returned from exile. We were all gathered there, all the journalists, the international press, and uh, it looked like it was going to drag out. So I said, I'll, I'll do something else for a while. Uh, I'll go and visit my friend, uh, the tailor down the street. So I left. Uh, Arafat's headquarters, went to visit the tailor down the street and um, told him, please turn on the TV so that when I see it's about to start, I can run back. We started talking about lots of different things and suddenly I realized we're halfway in to the press conference. Now I'm certain they're going to fire me, send me back to Stockholm. Uh, I have absolutely failed. So I had to solve this somehow. And I uh, told the tailor, this is, you know, this is a catastrophe for me. I'm supposed to cover that press conference. Now you are going to have to do something to help me. So uh, I did an interview for the radio with the tailor about Yasser Arafat and asked him, don't you think it's time for him to stop wearing military fatigues and, you know, wear a regular suit uh, because now he's the president and the, uh, the uh, uh, armed struggle is over and he should be wearing something else. Uh, this became a long story. I sent back the report and the e I was terrified, of course. The editors back in Stockholm called me afterwards and I was afraid that they were going to say, you goofed, you missed the most important press conference, we sent you to do this and um, you, you'll get another chance, but you might have to leave, you might have to come back. Instead they said, hey, that was a great idea. How did you think of that? To go and interview a tailor about his uh, military fatigues and a suit. That's brilliant. That was uh, one of the uh, stumblings on my road uh, in the Middle East. And the tailor um, turned out to be a great political analyst. So I returned to him time and time again and asked him about the suit and the military fatigues and why is Arafat not doing anything about this. He told me lots of different stories about, you know, the different timing in, in the Palestinian struggle and what he should be wearing and also very symbolic tales of how he himself, the tailor, had to alter uh, one of the military suits that uh, Arafat had imported from France, from Nafnaf, uh, trying to make me sense the symbolism in this that Arafat was too short and too small for this French suit. Um, I continued to make mistakes. One of the best things about being a journalist is that uh, you do not, like a politician, have to go out into the real world to find proof for your ideology, your theory. Journalists are supposed to challenge everything that we think we know. Uh, we don't always do that. Um, but um, when we do, uh, I mean, sometimes we do it by mistake. I did this when I was the correspondent in the United States. I went out one day uh, in a small town, America. I was uh, going to do a story about how ignorant Americans are when it comes to Sweden and Scandinavia, Swedes. Uh, so I was just going to do a very lazy vox pop, you know, you walk into the street and you interview five people and then you have your story, you go home and you say this is what Americans think about Sweden. So uh, I was sure they were going to say, you know, polar bears and uh, Copenhagen is the capital. The first guy I meet on the street, he's wearing sandals and a checkered shirt and I ask him, do you know anything about Sweden? And he says, yeah, you know. I think the books that Gunnar Myrdal wrote about race relations in America are some of the best <coughs> ever written. Gunnar Myrdal, uh, Gunnar Myrdal was the father of uh, Jan Myrdal, uh, uh, a very famous Swedish uh, sociologist. 
okay, he doesn't fit into these samples. I will erase him from the tape later and I continued uh, my walk down the street. I saw uh, a, a guy, uh, an older man in a white suit, and I think he even had white shoes, and I thought, this guy does not know anything about Sweden. So I walk up to him, and uh, he says, Sweden, well, you know, I could never really make up my mind which one I like the best, the seventh seal or wild strawberries. The seventh seal, Shundin Seglet, Wild Strawberries, Smultronstället, two great movies by Ingmar Bergman, who lived here uh, on Fore, uh, north of, uh, uh, of this island. Um, to challenge your own prejudices is one of the best things that we journalists can do. And another one is to realize when you are in a story, you make the mistake of thinking, I'm going to do a report about a victim. And you reach this person and um, you can't really do the story that you set out to do. This happened to me when I interviewed Samira Ibrahim. You might have heard of her, a young 25-year-old Egyptian woman who was subjected to the extremely humiliating virginity tests in Egypt. She was an activist on Tahrir Square. She was arrested, taken to the military uh, uh, hospital for uh, interrogation and exposed to a virginity test where they stripped her naked in front of 10 people in a room uh, they forced her to undress using electric rods and then forced her down on a bed. And while she was telling me all this, she was, of course, in tears, uh, saying that I thought I was going to have a heart attack when the military doctor put his finger inside me for five minutes in order to check whether or not I was a virgin. I went to see this young woman. Uh, and I knew that she was starting a trial against the military. She had come out and uh, talked about this, but she said, I don't talk to media because uh, they are too one-dimensional. I don't want to be um, only the, the girl who went through the virginity test. I don't want to be that kind of victim. And uh, uh, she told me the story, of course, uh, but also told me about her how strong she had become because this was so shameful uh, to admit to having been sexually harassed, as we heard Rebecca talking about, is extremely shameful in uh, a country like Egypt. And Samira is veiled, she is religious, uh, and sh her mother is illiterate, her father uh, was reluctant, but then encouraged her to go forth with a military trial. And then she says, look, I'm not going to be put into this box of being the girl with the virginity test. My struggle now is going to be against the Islamists. I'm religious, I have a veil, but if they come to power and say that the veil is compulsory, I am goddamn going to take it off of my head. Another incident of doing stories about uh, suffering was recently when I went to Gaza and met uh, uh, two young men who were uh, s artists. They had studied art in Gaza, uh, where, um, of course, studying art I is a bit odd because uh, when you study painting, you cannot paint a model. I'm not talking about a naked model, but a model uh, is not uh, permitted. So I was going to do a story about the hardships uh, of uh, art and uh, painting and uh, filmmaking, which is what they wanted to get into uh, under Hamas rule in Gaza. So these two students, um, uh, twins, uh, identical twins, uh, started telling me about their hardships and then they started talking about their dreams and said, 
what we really want to do is film, cinema. Uh, but there's no uh, movie theater in Gaza. There isn't a cinema. It was uh, burnt down in 1987, the year before these two twins were, were born. And uh, so we started doing movie posters. First the movie poster and then the film. And they made uh, movie posters with their own pictures. They took pictures of, of themselves, of each other, these identical twins, and they made short movies uh, where they were both fighting each other to symbolize the internal strife between the fa Palestinian factions. And th this became a huge project, the Gaza poster. Um, a very odd way to start making movies, but they made the posters and they called every single imaginary film. Uh, uh, they gave these films the names of different um, Israeli wars or operations like Grapes of Wrath, like Summer Rain, Cast Lead, and this became a huge project that they had been working on. Then they made a short movie which was picked up by someone in the United States who invited them over uh, to show the movie. They got out of Gaza, which was uh, a huge ordeal. They went to Austin, Texas, and uh, the Americans said, so you would like to see a movie in a real movie theater? Yes! Uh, you'd like to see your own movie? Yes, of course they wanted to see their own movie. And what else would you like to see? Uh, you can pick a movie and we'll show it. And the twins um, started discussing amongst themselves and uh, one of them said, well, maybe we should choose this film. No, we'll choose this. What they were choosing between was Tarkovsky and Ingmar Bergman. Two 24-year-old uh, twins from Gaza who had never been outside Gaza, never uh, seen a movie in a movie theater, uh, chose in the end uh, the Ingmar Bergman mov mi movie Visknigar uh, Rup. That was what they wanted to see on the big screen. And uh, why? Uh, is this uh, a sign of the world is getting better? Because kids in Gaza can watch movies um, uh, on the internet that they had would never have been able to see uh, a couple of years ago uh, and choose an Ingmar Bergman movie, which I thought was just amazing that these two 24-year-old uh, Gaza uh, rapping, cool uh, artists chose Viskning Ararup. I think the world is, the, the image of the Arab is getting better, but let's try and keep it that way by not falling back into Islamophobia and Arabophobia. Thank you. <laughs>